morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Center for Strategic and International Studies and our Statesman's Forum this morning. It's great to see so many Haiti experts uh, in the audience, many of whom I recognized and we've worked uh, together in the past. I'm Steve Johnson, director of the CSIS Americas program, and it's a real privilege to bring this kind of program to you today. Before we get started, just a couple of quick administrative details. I'd like to ask you to please turn off your cell phones to silent or vibrate mode. And during the question and answer session that follows our invited speaker, we'd ask you to please raise your hand so one of our staff can come to you uh, with a, a microphone so that we can hear your uh, questions or comments. Also, and when it is your turn, please identify yourself and the organization that you represent. I know this is a, a rare opportunity to have a dialogue with somebody that you don't often get to have very much contact with, a person who travels a great deal and a person who's very busy in his home country in the Caribbean. But at the same time, uh, it's really important to, for you to keep your questions and also your commentaries short so that we have time for more than just one question. Now before we introduce the Prime Minister of Haiti, I'd like to point out that there are two ways of looking at this Caribbean nation. One is through the lens of reconstruction, plagued by the slow delivery of donor funds and people still living in tents. The other is the reality of a parliament that seems to be working and a government that is moving forward toward building a Haiti that is competitive and, and creative, a country that has a new narrative. Please keep that contrast in mind as you hear the Prime Minister's remarks today. To introduce our speaker, I've asked CSIS America's program senior associate, associate and Caribbean expert Anton Edmonds to join us. Anton formerly served as the executive director of Caribbean Central American Action, a wonderful organization that frequently partners with CSIS. And he is now the president of the Edmonds Group International. Please welcome Anton Edmonds. Thank you, Steve, and thank you very much for the opportunity to introduce our guest today, Prime Minister Lamont. Before we go on, though, I'd like to recognize um, the Ambassador of Haiti up front, as well as the Minister of Finance, along with the Head of the Senate, as well as the Prime Minister's Deputy Chief of Staff, who's probably the hardest working man today. Um, a product of a, of a household filled with academic and artistic influences, Prime Minister Lamont studied in Florida at Barry and St. Thomas Universities respectively, where he obtained a bachelor's degree in political science and a master's in business management. He was a co-founder of the Global Voice Group, a successful emerging markets telecommunications management and technology firm, which he left after answering the call of the, his country and the presidential campaign of Michel Martelly. Mr. Lamont served as Mr. Martelly's special advisor and following the election, he co-chaired the Presidential Advisory Council for the Economic Development and Investment in Haiti with former President Bill Clinton. And he also served as a member of the Interim Commission for the Reconstruction of Haiti. In October 2011, President Martelly appointed Mr. Lamont as the Minister of Foreign and Religious Affairs, a position he held until he replaced Prime Minister Gary Corneille this past May. As Prime Minister, he has accelerated ongoing reconstruction efforts and has focused on jump-starting Haiti's e economic development. He has also prioritized the consolidation of democratic practices in Haiti to safeguard the country's political stability. Two and a half years after the 2010 earthquake, Haiti still has great needs and big challenges in transforming itself from the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere to a net contributor to the international community. In its favor, the country does have great talent. With leaders like Prime Minister Lamont, perhaps the stars are beginning to align. And I welcome the opportunity to introduce the, the Prime Minister to outline exactly how he plans to make the stars align. Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Anton, for the kind words. And those stars 
I'm going to try to tell you how I'm planning on making them align. I'd like to thank the CSIS for hosting today's event and providing me and providing Haiti with a platform to share with you the vision and the strategy that we'll be putting forward to, to develop Haiti. And I'm proud to inform you that Haiti today is on the right track. We're on the right track. We have a democratically elected president in Michel Martelli, who has approval ratings upwards of 80%. We're driving the country forward with determination to get the development right this time. I was ratified as prime minister only two months ago. Two months is a relatively short time to develop a country that has such great needs. The parliament and my government are putting together a coalition of some sort to get the country on the right track, to strengthen the democracy, the economy, build up the institutions, and attract foreign direct investment. And of course, the main theme of my government is to fight extreme poverty. Haiti is a country where over 60% of the population is living with less than a dollar a day. And it's simply unacceptable. And we're doing everything that we can, and we'll be doing everything that we can to change that statistic. I've accepted the responsibility with the conviction that Haiti must finally optimize its natural resources and endowments to generate long-term sustainable economic growth. We have a dynamic culture and more than 1,600 kilometers of seashore among the very best in the Caribbean. We have wide sandy beaches, year-round sun, and some of the world's most beautiful beaches. We can capitalize on this natural resource to create a vibrant tourism sector, which will, in, in turn, attract foreign exchange, foreign investment, and revenues, and create jobs for Haitians. Jobs are badly needed in Haiti. We have a large population and immense business opportunities, and this in a multitude of sectors that need to be promoted, that need to be supported, and that's the job that the, that the president has asked me to do and that I'm trying to do to the best of my knowledge. We have opportunities in agriculture, tourism, real estate, reconstruction, infrastructure development. Haiti lost over 42 public buildings. Uh, we have a deficit of over 400,000 homes. Manufacturing, we have the HELP um, Act with the United States. We have the Caracol Park that, that's being built. Services, banking, and finance. Before discussing the Haiti's development strategy, I wanted to give you an update on the country's reconstruction effort. We are beginning to see real changes in Haiti. We've made significant progress in removing the rubble and repairing the homes that were damaged after the earthquake. More importantly, since President Martelli was sworn in, we have made we have made substantial progress in reducing the number of earthquake victims living in the tents. There were ne nearly 1.8 million people living in, in homeless shelters when the president took office. With the assistance of NGOs, the international community, friends of Haiti, we were able to reduce that number to less than 400,000 due to the implementation of the government's uh, relocation strategy. In a program called 166, we were able in the past few months to remove the people living in the, in the main public, um, public parks. Now kids are, are, are playing soccer on the parks, kid, kids are playing, people are walking. So Haiti, so Port-au-Prince is starting to live again. But we've just started and we have much more to do. We have a long-term housing strategy that will create homes for those living in difficult circumstances. We've already built 1,000 low-income housing in a 3,000 income uh, community, building 
industrial parks, building parks, schools in, a, in an integrated um, community. A few days ago, on July 4th, I was invited by the outgoing U.S. Ambassador, Mr. Ken Merton, to celebrate the 236th anniversary of the U.S. Declaration of Independence. On that day, Ambassador Merton made a very moving speech. In a few words, he shared with his guest his conviction that Haiti was indeed on the right path. More recently, he publicly shared that his time as ambassador had given him a front row seat to history, and that Haiti was a nation with a bright future, a country with a vibrant, a proud, hardworking, and courageous people who faced adversity and kept climbing. Ambassador Martin indeed got it right. Haiti is climbing and will continue to do so under our watch. In Haiti, we've started to see real changes. And I invite you to go to Haiti and see for yourself the changes that are happening. The government has started to take decisions, decisions that were once difficult to take. We've started to take them on the first day in office. We are following the president's 5E, 5E approach, which is education, energy, environment. And mostly, we're focusing on two things. We're focusing on reducing the inequalities, on focusing on the fight against extreme poverty, and we're focusing on, on energy and electricity as a vector of development. We have a clear action plan for the next four years. And this action plan consists of the construction of major infrastructure, airports, ports, the construction of the public buildings that fell down during the earthquake. It will be enormous and we recognize that we need to do it quickly and we need to get it right. And we are putting all the hours of the day at that task. Haiti currently has only one international airport which was destroyed during the earthquake. That's almost, that's 95% completed right now. The Cap Haitian airport, which will give access to the second um, largest city of Haiti, is 70% completed, will be done in February 2013. The, the national port that was destroyed during the earthquake, we've already started the, the bid process and should start in October of this year. We are paving over 50 kilometers of roads, fixing and maintaining the roads, which is a priority for Haitians the construction of hospitals, the major hospital which was supposed to start, which is the, the general hospital, will begin in the next three months. So we're very happy about that. And focusing on energy, with the objective of doubling the country's current energy capacity by the end of President Martelli's term in office. We've created a new ministry in charge of energy security. and we've created a commission to work with all the international community, with the Haitian government, and all the experts in the sector to, to develop the, an energy plan for the future that will bring Haiti to the next step. We cannot have development if we don't have electricity. We are very excited about the Caracol Industrial Park, located in the northern part of Haiti. This will be a model not only for Haiti, but for the Caribbean. Haiti has the HELP Act uh, with the United States, and the Caracol Park is a perfect example of job creation, and is the perfect example of success, a successful development mechanism to bring jobs and sustainable um, ways of doing business. Right now, I visited the park a few weeks ago, and I saw the hope, I saw the encouragement, I saw, I saw the vibrance of the people getting a job and working sometimes for the first time. And the advantage of the park is that it takes people living in extreme poverty and gives them the opportunity to become 
a player in the economic development of the country. Right now, this park will create over 20,000 jobs. If you take a multiplicator by 20, which is the way it is for indirect jobs in Haiti, this park will have a positive impact of over 400,000 people, therefore most of the northern department. So this is significant indeed. We are very happy about the relationship with the foreign partners. The United States has done for Haiti what no other development partners has done. By focusing on, on, on the park, by focusing on bringing the energy, um, the ele electricity to the park, by focusing on also now bringing a port of, in the Northern Industrial, for the Northern Industrial Park, we are now in a situation where we'll be able to work on the decentralization policy, bringing people from Port-au-Prince outside into the northern part of the country. And in, and in turn, it will create an economic boom by bringing foreign investment, job creation, we take people out of poverty and we put them in a level where they, where they can have dignity again. Dignity in development. Haiti, we found, we found a country that was shattered, a country that has very often a reputation of a, corrupt, of a corrupted nation. And what, and what have we done for that? Well, we're taking aggressive steps to fight the corruption and to change the image of Haiti. Haiti today has the chance to change, to change the reputation, to shock the world, to show that we can do things differently. We are committed to changing that image. The president is committed, the government is committed, and we, we want to do it in all transparency. Transparency beginning by airing the Council of Ministers live on television to show the people what are we doing for them and what the government, what actions is the government taking to improve their, their daily lives. We are committed at making this Haiti work. For too long, we've been a proud nation, but a, na but a nation that was unable to develop itself. And when I look at around this room, when I look at, when I go to the, to the conferences, the support that Haiti has from its friends, from people that want to see us do well, only with a leadership that understands that, People are not against us, they are with us. They want to see us succeed and embracing them and making them feel at home. We have a chance, not only for a few people, but for 10 million Haitians living in Haiti and for 4 million Haitians living abroad. We have, we have a historical opportunity to make change happen for real. We have a young leadership. Most of the people in the Prime Minister's cabinet, they're 40 and under. That, that's bringing change in the management. We have capacity issues, capacity building issues. But we don't like to focus on the problems, but we like to focus rather on the solutions. For too long, Haitians have been, have been focusing on problems and not focusing on what's good about the country. If you look at a country that has an, employ an unemployment rate of 52%. The main, the main driver needs to be job creation. So we believe that we in the, with the industrial park, this is one way to go. The tourism sector. The tourism sector is a sector that's been missing in action. We have one area called Labadi, and that area is one where Royal Caribbean has been investing. It's getting 600,000 tourists every year. And we felt that it was important for the country to show a different area, to show what we can do. And as um, cultural tourism improve and increase around the world and in the Caribbean, Haiti is the perfect destination for cultural tourism. Why? Because we have a rich history. We are the first independent black republic. And we're very proud of that, and we have to showcase it. We've helped uh, leaders of the South American Liberation Movement, um, patron um, Simon Bolivar. 
Therefore, we're investing in cultural tourism in the city of Jack Mill. The government right now is renovating the city as we're talking. Work is going on. Work is going on in, in the city to rebuild the airport, to attract tourism. Right now, you'll be able to go from Fort Lauderdale directly to, to Jack Mill in the next few months. We are redoing the, um, the um, convention center. We're redoing the seashore. We are renovating 45 homes, um, redoing museums. We're investing $40 million of our hard-earned money into that, uh, into that city to show what Haiti can do and what Haiti can become. And this is just a seed because, of course, the government itself cannot develop by itself. We need the support of the private sector to do so. But we need a jump start. So that's why we invested this into the city of Jacques Mel to show what the city can do. The private sector investments have already started to come. There are hotels being built in the city. The city has one of the most beautiful um, beaches in the Caribbean and Haiti, and the government understands that, and we're taking advantage of that. We're taking advantage as well of something that we discovered recently, and that's, that could be a game changer, is that Haiti has a potential of 20 billion worth of gold mines. Now, I had several interviews. Many people are wondering, what is the government? Is the government going to take the right decision? And, and what, what is the government plans on in the mines? Well, basically, what we're doing is that there is a few companies uh, working the minefields right now. We want to make sure that we make the right decisions before we jump um, and sign uh, mining concessions. The, the Haitian law, we are working at revamping it to protect the interest, not only the interest of Haiti, but the environmental impact interest. We want to make sure that the royalty fees are where they're supposed to be. And we're negotiating upwards of 10% uh, royalties right now. We've, we've, uh, we're working with uh, some agencies, some, some uh, non-profit organizations to get the right approach. Because what we want is to protect Haiti's interests. At the same time, we want to protect the investors' interests to make sure that it's a win-win situation for both parties. As we're pro-business government, we want business to flourish. And at the same time that business flourishes, we want the, the Haitian people to benefit. $20 billion can make a big difference and can, and can go a long way into improving the people's lives and can go a long way into changing the country's uh, infrastructure. And we are counting on, on this to make a big difference in the way the countries manage. Historically, Haiti has been a country that has had bad luck and also bad governance. This government is committed at changing that particular governance issue. We are working to improve the competency at every, at every level and improving the decision making at those level. We have a new center for facilitation of investment. We have a new leadership there. We've created the Presidential Investment Advisory Board to, to facilitate investments coming into Haiti with one objective, is job creation. Job creation is, as we see it, one of the only means of getting the people, graduate them to graduate people outside of the extreme poverty. And our work has started to pay off. The headlines are becoming more and more encouraging if you follow the news on Haiti. Just last week, President Martelli and Cheryl Mills have visited the park to notice the progress that have been happening there. Education has always been a challenging point in Haiti. In the education, We've designed a permanent source of financing for the, for, for the education of our kids. And we've been able to waive tuitions for over 1 million children and taking 142,000 new children that never attended school before, they were, now they're able to attend school. And we're very proud and very happy about that. This coming school year, we'll be adding half a million children to that roster to have 1.5 million children in school. 
school meals, school canteens is always a problem. Putting the, 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 the child in school is one, feeding the child in school is, is another. So what we're doing is we're improving the canteen program from 1 million to 1.5 million to, to match those that are going to school to find a hot meal um, while at school. What we're doing as well, and what we're very proud of, is as we improve the access to schools, it's important also to improve the quality of the schools and the quality of the teachers. In a country where 70%, what we found was 70% of teachers did not have a sixth grade education. So teacher training, it becomes critical. And we're focusing on a teacher training program, working with different universities in order to train the teachers, in order to, to, to provide a better education for our children. A new law was introduced in, in Parliament called the FNE, the National Education Fund. With the National Education Fund, Haiti will be able to raise over $100 million a year. And, and there their taxes and surcharges on different aspects. For example, um, and there is a, a surcharge on, the, on the, the, the money transfer going into Haiti, on the phone calls going into Haiti, on, 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 uh, on different aspects of, for example, cigarette sales, alcohol sales, and, and proceeds of those go into the education fund. And this, in turn, will finance the teacher training, uh, the building of new schools, the school canteen programs, the tuition uh, waiver programs. And, and this is a permanent way of doing it. So we'll have, with this fund, we'll have largely solved the education uh, problem in Haiti. We want to build social protection program. We're one of the poorest country in the hemisphere, and we want to stay like that forever. But in order to, to understand the situation, what we've done is created some social protection programs, which never existed in Haiti. Right now, we're working on, on, on a universal health care card that gives, that gives the poorest, those that have no, the voiceless, access to basic health care by giving them access to preventive uh, medicines. We're starting with that. We're also starting with a condition, we've started a conditional cash transfer program as a, in the social protection program. That will, include, that, that, that will include, and that already has about 6,000 moms in a program that will include 100,000 moms living in extreme poverty. On the poverty map, we've selected those that are the most vulnerable and, in, and included them in a program called uh, Dear Little Mother, Tima Mancheri, that will in, in turn give them a conditional cash transfer of $20 a month. I have to tell you that those are currently living with about 50 cents per day. So basically we're doubling their income and putting them into micro credit uh, programs and therefore being able to do micro enterprises and then graduating them outside of the poverty, the extreme poverty line. We've also, and we're talking in two months, huh? in the institutional sphere, <laughs> we've managed the to put the, an independent judiciary, which is called the CSPG. We've, uh, th there was a problem of perception with some rogue former military. In the first three days, we ordered the police force to go in and take them out and restoring a secure and stable security situation. We're doing a lot of judicial uh, reforms, pre-trial detention to, uh, to reduce the number of people in the jails. Improving, improving the pay of the judges, improving the pay of the clerks. Right now, a clerk was earning about $200 a month in a system. We've, we've doubled that now. It's 400. It's still far where it's supposed to be, but it's, it's, it's something. It's moving forward. We believe in moving forward. You know, standing still is not an option for us. And we believe that impossible is not in our vocabulary. We're working. Again, we have a, a, a team of young and dynamic uh, people to get the development right this time around. So Haiti, in short, we've also changed the theme of the foreign policy, bringing business diplomacy, 
and a theme that has made uh, a lot of discussions in Haiti. But business diplomacy is about bringing investments and keeping the investment and, cre and keeping the right environment for those investments to come. So we're very happy and we're very excited about where Haiti is heading. And of course, all of you that are here, you've probably, this is probably not the first speech of a prime minister or of a Haitian leader that you've heard. But it's one that has passion and it's one that has dedication and it's one that's committed do, to do the right thing and to make the right decisions. We're here to work and to work with you, to facilitate you. If you want to come into Haiti, we invite you to come, not only as investors, but also to spend some vacation and spend some of the hard-earned dollars that you earn over here. You can go and spend it over there, create some economic uh, opportunities in Haiti. We feel that it's a new day and things are moving in the right direction. In the security situation, we've taken steps to improve the, the, the security situation substantially. We are buying more supplies for the police, motivating, I mean, we're increasing their pay also to, to motivate them. There is more checkpoints. The kidnapping rate has almost disappeared. So we're very happy about that. And we're taking steps to build a a, a new police force that has access to all the communal sections. Right now, the police is not present everywhere. We want them to be present everywhere. So we will add about 1,500 officers to, ha to have police presence everywhere on the territory. And also to build a special, a rapid response force that will be able to respond to any security situations as the need arise. And finally, we are looking for investors in the energy sector because we want to do a consortium, a consortium of public and private companies. And the need is 500 megawatts of power, a new distribution line across the country, and prepaid meters to reduce from the, to improve on the 18% collection rate that we currently have right now. Having said that, we have a lot of projects little time to, to, to do it, but it can be done. I think with hard work, with, with, uh, with the spirit that, yes, we can, I think we'll be able to get there. Thank you. As we open up for questions, remember, two months, okay? <laughs> so we're now gonna open for questions. Uh, I will start right here. And if, if, if you remember, identify yourself, your affiliation, and then question. Good morning, your excellence. Congratulations on the first two months. You get an A. <laughs> um, my question, my name, first of all, is Dominique Toussaint. I'm the chairman of Mobilize for Haiti. My organization works on emergency management and preparedness. Uh, we also work on housing. Uh, the question that I have is, within the next 10 months, would you or your administration introduce legislation to adopt a national emergency response plan? Um, because it also has housing implications on the folks who are still residing in the tent cities. Thank you. Right now, we are currently in uh, implementing a national emergency response, and we've we've named it 166 in order to focus. The original intent was to focus on on uh, six main tent cities and relocate them into 16 original neighborhoods of where they keep basically fixing the homes of people that, ha that, that were affected, that move into the tent cities. So, so now, the national emergency plan is, is being implemented all over the country. So we're identifying, especially in the, housing, in the housing sector, is to identify people living under the tents, relocate them, fix their homes, renovating the neighborhoods, bringing light, bringing health centers, community center into those neighborhoods as we are building new uh, housing uh, communities. New housing communities, we've already started doing that. 
we have one that's built that has 400 homes that's called 400 percent because the idea was to build 400 homes in 100 days um, we've completed that and the people have moved in now we move into the phase of of a, of a larger community that has 3,000 homes that has an industrial park uh, to to create jobs that has a, a public park a school a hospital water treatment plant so this is this will be a model and, and it's completely uh, built uh, hurricane uh, it's it's hurricane proof and it's uh, anti seismic so this will be a community an exemplary um, community as we like to call it because it will take into account one the people that don't have the means they will find a community where they can go but it's not going to be free we're going to charge a small amount for the maintenance and and the people that were victims during the earthquake they will be given first priority Prime Minister, it's a pleasure to meet you. My name is Donald Stevens. I'm the president of Shelter at Home Haiti. We went to Haiti about a year before the earthquake. In October 2009, our corporation was, um, was started in, in Port-au-Prince. So that's three months before the earthquake. We were there to support the, construct or the construction of decent, affordable houses that were highly resistant to earthquake and hurricane as part of the HOPE Act legislation. Our application has been in the CFI for two and a half years. Two weeks ago, we got word that verbally that our that our franchise has been approved, but now we still wait for the official document to come from the Minister of Finance to determine how long our franchise is going to be good for. I'd like to ask you if you could help me push that through, so that we could begin to bring in the 2.5 million dollar investment and expand on the 65 jobs that we've already created to more than several hundred that we plan to uh, to create um, based on our manufacturing program. Thank you. Well, the Minister of Finance is here, so you <laughs> <laughs> that's the person, you know, she's the iron lady, as I like to call her, so she'll be able to help you with that, and of course, we welcome, uh, we welcome the investments, and of course, you have to understand that we're taking a situation where there was a, a problem of governance and making decisions, and a bureaucracy also that slowed down every single process um, and when I got into to the Prime Minister's office two months ago the printer wasn't working to give you an example of of, of, of the the challenges that we face printer wasn't working the AC in, in the Prime Minister's office was not working so while people were you know struggling with their daily lives me I had to to put up an office in, 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 a, in a very you know short period of time so um, we are working you know day and night at, at solving some of the basic problems and, and yours is, is one that many people have which is um, you know not being able to 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 get underground running and we're working on that we're working also on in the in the month of before September 15th you'll be able to register online register companies online to reduce the number of days and we'll have completed most of the steps that that add up to make the 108 days to open a company in Haiti well online will have done everything completed the, the steps for the investor and you'll be able to go online to uh, to open uh, to open a company which will make Haiti more business friendly uh, as relating to your particular issue I think the Minister of Finance and her chief of staff will be able to solve your issue and we'll try to solve it in this in this uh, today <laughs> uh, well, you, I mean, we, he, he's solving it for you right now. He's saying that you have the, 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 the documents. We have no documents. You will have the documents. We have no paper documents. All we have is the verbal from our attorney to send me the documents to approve. And now we can do it. Okay, so, so then what we'll do is, you, you know, we'll invite you uh, to, to come to Haiti like this you know you can spend a few nights there and uh, <laughs> and take the documents in hand Donald, but Donald. but it will be done Next week I'll be my 29th trip, so. wonderful <laughs> what we would like to do is I'd like to take three questions at a time um, short 
uh, so that we can then get the PM to respond to them en masse. I'd like to start with uh, the lady right here, um, the lady right there, and then David Hatch. So if the three of you could stand so that you could be identified and then give your questions and then we move forward from there. Thank you very much. I'm Ann Phillips from the Woodrow Wilson Center. Just a quick question apropos uh, the first comment. Haiti has been called the Republic of NGOs and that so many non-governmental organizations were in Haiti even before the earthquake, 10,000, 12,000. What I'm wondering is what, how is your government gaining some oversight and uh, strategic control over these many, many non-governmental organizations, many of whom I'm sure are well intended. Thank you. Um, bonsoir, Premier Ministre. Je suis Tori Anizag de la Télévision Nationale d'Haïti. On est en direct depuis ici, en Haïti. Ma question est la suivante. Alors, je crois qu'Haïti est ouvert dorénavant aux investissements. D'ailleurs, le gouvernement en fait son cheval de bataille. Et nous allons parler pratiquement du... Alors, nous allons parler sur le dossier de la construction euh, du parc industriel de Nord à Caracol et d'un port ouvert au commerce extérieur à Fort Liberté afin de créer des débouchés justement pour les activités du parc sur la mer. Pouvez-vous nous, pouvez nous fournir plus de détails à ce sujet, s'il vous plaît Merci. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. My name is David Hatch, and I'm with the Inter-American Institute for Cooperation in Agriculture, commonly known as ICA. And we've been operating in Haiti for uh, about 50 years. Um, the concern that we have is in part the, the, the NGO issue. We have something like 400 NGOs operating in agriculture within Haiti. And there, is, there isn't really any coordinated, cohesive means of, of focusing all of that effort and attention and resources on agriculture. What we're seeing in Haiti real quickly is, is the migration from the rural sector to the, to the cities and then after the earthquake back to the rural sector. And our concern is what is, <clears throat> what is the government of Haiti going to be doing to keep individuals in the rural sector and develop that? You, miss, you mentioned, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, a, a reference to environment and a reference to agriculture. And, and our concern is the need based on prior studies, and, and Brazil is a perfect example with their zero hunger program, that countries have found that the best way to, to reduce hunger and reduce poverty is a vibrant agricultural sector. And so our question is, uh, what can we do as ICA, uh, since we work with the agriculture minister very frequently, but what can we do uh, to work more effectively within the government, and what can the government do to invest more in agriculture uh, to help people in the rural sector have uh, great livelihoods. Thank you. So I got my three questions. The first three questions. All right. So for Ann Phillips, Haiti has been called the Republic of NGOs. It's true. And we're also taking steps in order to have the NGOs be coordinated. So yesterday we had a meeting and, and the president has asked me to, to solve the NGO problem, basically. Um, and it's not really a problem per se. What it is, it's a, lack of, it's a lack of policy to coordinate their work. When the NGOs come in, if they come into an environment that's not regulated, or if they come into an environment that has absolutely no, no ground rules for how they should operate, they do what they think is best. Which, and we cannot blame them for that. So what we're doing uh, regarding the NGOs is, is, is very simple. One, we, meet, we met with them. We're gonna have, we're gonna have a, an NGO, um, if you want, summit in Haiti with, with most of the larger uh, um, NGOs. We're gonna ask them to organize themselves as a, as a federation, if you want, um, in order to have an, an interface with the government. We ask them to follow the government plan and priorities on the strategic development plan. We ask, we got, we're going to ask that group, that federation that's gonna rep, because we cannot meet with 10,000 NGOs every time. We can meet with a few that represent the interest and they will be, they will be, uh, we will work with them in order to give them the priorities of the government and we'll ask them to follow those priorities. We ask the NGOs to register with the Ministry of External Cooperation to have a database of NGOs and what they're doing in Haiti and the sectors that they're intervening in. 
and there will be sectorial uh, priorities as they move forward, they will move forward according to the strategy develop, de development plan of the Haitian government. And there will be some follow-up to make sure that they are following this. They, that, that will be done as a first step. As we cannot change everything overnight, we feel that most of the NGOs working in Haiti, they're working there with the intent to help and with a good heart. So the idea is not to scare them or drive them away. The idea is to take them in and organize them and make them make a difference for Haiti on the long run. And that's what we're going to work on doing. TNH. Haiti is open to investment. Haiti is open for business. That's, a, that's true. And, um, and as such, we feel that Haiti being open for business is not a new concept because every other country in the world is also open for business. Haiti should have been open for business a long time ago, but it, it, because of, of political instability and because of bad decisions, Haiti was never open for business. Every country in the world has foreign direct investment. Every country in the world is promoting the resources, the beauties that they have in different sectors. Haiti had, had not been doing that. This government is doing that and will continue to do that because we feel that Haiti's private sector has been decapitalized after the, the embargo because Haiti being one of the poorest countries in the world suffered a three-year embargo and many people forget that. That embargo cut off Haiti for the from the rest of the world for over, over three years and that took a bad situation and made it worse. Outside of that, we've had hurricanes, floods, and on top of it, we've had an earthquake that destroyed 56,000 homes um, and that killed over 250,000 people. So that set us back even more. But we're not, we're not gonna stay here and complain about that. We're gonna rather talk about what we're gonna be doing today, tomorrow, and what we're doing to, to drive the country forward. Um, and what we're talking about is investments. We're talking about the, the Northern Industrial Park. We're talking about Jacques Mel. We're talking about our beaches. We're talking about Ilavash. I invite you all to visit or to Google Ilavash. And I feel that, you know, I was there myself last week and it's the nicest island I've been to by far in the Caribbean. I'm sorry for the other Caribbean brothers and sisters that are here, but have to promote Haiti. Haiti first. <laughs> um, David Hatch from, uh, from Ica. You know, my father was renting Ica an office for over 10 years, and that's actually what paid my, my college years. <laughs> so so I have a special, you have a special place in my heart. Um, job creation in, in agriculture is one of the key elements for the development of this country. One of the biggest problems that, that Haiti faces today is the fact that, is the fact that um, farmers left the farms, went to Port-au-Prince in, in search of economic opportunities, and that, you know, the, uh, the accumulation of the farmers into the town, not only when there was no jobs, so it created a situation of joblessness, unemployment, and hunger because they left the farms where they were producing to go into an environment where they couldn't produce to look for jobs and the jobs were not there. So now they are stuck between the two and that's why, that's why I talk about decentralization and the decentralization not only is in agriculture but it's, it's, in, it's in building also new towns, investing in new towns, creating jobs in different towns to bring people back to the original towns and to invest in those towns. The agriculture is Haiti currently imports $1.2 billion a year from the Dominican Republic. We invest $30 million a year in eggs, in lettuce, tomatoes, potatoes, rice, 200, over $300 million a year worth of rice imports. Where we imported, we used to, imp to, to, to have local uh, rice locally produced. We used to produce 120,000 metric tons of rice per year in 1992. Today, we consume 300,000 metric tons 
and we only produced 60,000. So we went down. Why? Because there was a bad decision made by a government, a previous government, reduce the rice tax from 35 to 3% that completely destroyed the agriculture, I mean the rice um, production in the country, lost massive amount of jobs, put farmers out of business, and we started importing a subsidized rice. Today, we are dependent on it, and, and we're in a situation where it's difficult to, to turn back the clock. So, um, the problem of the illegal smuggling on the Dominican to Haiti border is a big, is a is a bigger issue than than, than people think, because as we're trying to produce eggs, as we're trying to to produce a chicken uh, farm industry, in order to do so, the price must be competitive, and every time we do this, we have illegal smuggling on the border that brings in the chicken, that brings in the, the eggs, and that kills the local production. So we we've, we've taken steps to to secure the border by starting to put gates on the border because there was no gates. I went, I did a visit there four weeks ago and I drove right in through the border and the first gate was the Dominican Republic gate. So Haiti's border side had zero gates. On top of that, you know, again, bad decisions. We, out of a, a country that depends on its custom uh, duties for, that accounts for over 60% of, 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 of the of the national income, we open up the border for two days out of five. So we have a free market day where we lose five million dollars every day we, it's open. And now it's difficult to close it because you know people are used to it, I mean many small people are, are, are living off of that. So we're, take, we, so we're taking a decision to reduce the number of open days to, to, to stop, to stop the, the bleeding. But you know, those are decisions that, that, that have been taken and are, then we're gonna continue to make those good decisions in order to, to restore the, um, the agricultural um, independence and, uh, and food production of Haiti. Fortunately, we have three more questions. We're running out of time. I'd like to start with the lady at the back. Um, uh, the lady over here and then in the essence of, of, and the gentleman over here, <laughs> in the answers and balance. <laughs> um, good morning, Richenda Van Loon from the United Nations Foundation working on energy issues. Um, it's a pleasure to hear of um, your comments about the need for greater energy access in Haiti. And I'm wondering if you could just say a few comments about how you see, given Haiti's environmental challenges, um, the mix between um, renewable and conventional energy in the energy mix as you go forward and also um, given that uh, there are so many people living in poverty in Haiti who have no access to electricity how you see a tie-in between access and social protection for the community thank you good morning my name is Stephanie Benam I'm a government management fellow and proud to have attended law school at St. Thomas University my question is uh, whether you could address the role of the diaspora in uh, the rebuilding efforts more specifically if there are any special repatriation efforts, as well as what the Haitian American community can do to support your efforts. Mr. Prime Minister, <laughs> I have to see you as I ask my question. Uh, Ernie Preeg from the Haiti Democracy Project. First, I want to thank you. I was very, very favorably impressed by your presentation. I have long believed the Haitian people were talented, hardworking, but the government and lack of leadership has always been the problem. And now I have great hope that that problem is being overcome. My question, though, is, uh, hey, Democracy Project, we've had election observer teams for the past seven elections. Almost all of them have been Haitians. We look forward to our eighth election. Uh, but there's great uncertainty about uh, the uh, senatorial elections that are supposed to take place later this year. They're not dates, and in fact, the first step is uh, naming an electoral council, which hasn't been done yet, which is, a, uh, I would say, an urgent first step. Uh, so could you give us a, a comment on how this is shaping up and will there be an electoral council made uh, soon? Thank you. I'm going to start with the last. <laughs> Haiti Democracy Project. First of all, I want to congratulate you on the leadership and the uh, 
and also the the uh, I know you played a very important role in the last election where you sent a team and and and, uh, and basically helped the will of the, the people be become a reality because it wasn't so before your visit so I want to thank Jim also for for his uh, yes Definitely, I want to thank him for the leadership and and for what he's done for Haiti. Um, one of the important aspects of my term as prime minister is to organize elections, and we promise to do so this year. The steps we've taken, while there is some. Um, discussions as to what's happening. We've created a mixed commission uh, that has different members of the society in, in it to, cr to, to create, to work on the feasibility process and work on every important process as the discussions are going on. Financing, logistics, uh, partners involved, timelines. To, to start working on, on, on a framework. So all that, so, so the, the, the mixed commission has been working on that since the past three months, before even I was prime minister. So we've, we feel that we've had a very good process. Now we have commitments from donors. You know, we, we, we need to do a commitment ourselves. Maybe the, the minister of finance, you know, will have to <laughs> make a commitment of about $16 million for that. Uh, for that election, yes. <laughs> Steps have been taken for that to happen. There was a, 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 the step of the CSPJ, which is the, the judicial uh, uh, body, has been put forth. That was a precondition to the election. So many steps have happened. Now it's the last step. Well, one of the last steps into the forming is actually the the, the forming of the electoral uh, council. So there is discussions now as to naming nine members that are going to be permanent members. Out of the nine, I think we have, you know, the president of the Senate is also here, and uh, and we're working together in in order to try to find the right mix in order to have this process completed as soon as possible so that we can move to the election. So it's a priority for us and we're working hard at it to make it happen. And we, we look forward to, to the HDP, you know, observing that election as well. The question from St. Thomas University, that's my, that my alma mater here, diaspora involvement into Haitian affairs. I think Haiti is one of the top five countries in the world that has over 85% of, of uh, college graduates to actually leave the country. And, and those 85% represent today what you call you know, the diaspora. So any country that wants to move forward and develop itself and get out of mis and, and get out of the poverty level and, and, and reduce inequalities and, and 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 really become a nation needs brain power, and the brain power is currently working. There is many of you guys here in this room. So, Lauren Lamotte, Michel Martelli, Simon Dera the ambassador, we cannot do it by ourselves. We should make no mistake about it. We cannot develop the country by ourselves. We need to have the brain trust of the country that, that is living outside to understand that Haiti has a unique and historical opportunity to move its people. We have a responsibility for 14 million people to get the people out of extreme poverty levels, to, to, to have a country where all of us can be proud to see that we are Haitians and we have a country that's moving in the right direction. We cannot do it by ourselves. So that question, the, the answer to the question is, is obvious. We need you to, all the 
John Hopkins graduates, you know, George Washington, GW, all of you, and others that, are, that I'm, you know, forgetting. But we need you to come back and put what you learn to the service of your country. This is a, this is a, this is a must for development of Haiti. And the president of the Senate that's here can testify to the fact that the diaspora had two requests and we filled, we fulfilled 1.8 of those two requests. One, diaspora wanted to have the double nationality. Well, we passed the, the constitutional amendment. By the way, HDP, that was one of the prerequisites as well, the, the constitutional amendments. And Joe Baptist that came to Haiti to lobby, you know, about this. But you have to say something now that it's done also. So now it's done, all the diasporas now, there is one flag, one country, and one people. There is no diaspora Haitians or Haitians, no. Right now we're all one. The constitutional amendments is clear. You can have your passport, your Haitian, and you can participate fully into the development of your country. So we're very happy about that. So we look forward to seeing you soon. Energy issues. Haiti currently loses 65% of our production. We, we are, we have, we have a need of about 500, we have a demand for about 500 megawatts. Haiti right now is independently producing about 20, and, we're, and we have uh, power purchase agreements for the balance. So for the close to, I would say, 100 megawatts, we are subsidizing about $30 million a month. Out of that, we're losing 65%. When it just gets out of the of the grid, we lose 65% of the production. And when it's connected to the clients, we only collect 18% of the invoices. So it's a losing proposal. What we're doing, because I don't like to dwell on, on the problems, I like to focus on the solutions, as the people in my government well know, uh, because only solutions will move the country forward, not excuses. So we've had many years of excuses. Now it's time to come up with, 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 with concrete solutions. We task a commission, that's what I was saying in the speech, to work on, and I give him 60 days to produce the national uh, energy policy that will be the roadmap of where we're going. So that was, they, they have 15 days to produce it. And, uh, and I understand the first draft is done. We're waiting for it, and what we'll do for that is this. The, the Haitian government will commit a lot of resources into that program. Then we're looking for to create a consortium, a public-private consortium with, with partners that will come to invest in not only the production, because one of the issues is people only want to invest in production and have PPAs. We cannot have it like that. We need to have the production, the distribution, and the, it needs to be a partnership. So it can be a win-win for both parties. So we want to get to 500 megawatts. We want to have a consortium. We have several parties interested. We invite more parties to, to, to join and, and bring their expertise. It's going to be a mixed. Um, and the social access, actually, is not to me a problem. Because if you look at what, what happened in the uh, telecommunication sector, 20 years ago, in order to have a phone line in Haiti, and, and most of you that live in Haiti 20 years ago, you will testify to this. You needed to have some, sometimes some good political contacts to get a phone line at your house. And then you needed to have other contacts, connections in the government to get an, an international line. That one was, Teleco was a public a utility company, a, a public company. Now, with the emergence of the, of the cellular, um, companies, you, we went from having 20,000 people with phone lines postpaid to having over 4 million prepaid and that being the most vibrant industry in the country. And the same thing can happen for the energy. And what the phone companies have done in Haiti was very, uh, 
was very uh, was very nice because w what they, what they managed to do was to have a lot of the phones users in Haiti have their parents in Washington DC in New York in Miami top up the phones for them in Haiti so basically it was a win-win for everybody and we will so, so we have a winning model in South Africa most of the meters are prepaid in Haiti most of the meters need to be prepaid as well and we need to give the people at least the opportunity to top up or to recharge their prepaid meters instead of giving them no other choice but to tap on somebody else's uh, meter to have electricity of their own. Because the, because the system, the way it's, it's done right now, it gives the people no access to electricity, nothing else but tapping on somebody's lines. So that has to change, and everybody needs to have electricity, and it needs to pay for the electricity as well. So we can have, so we can have a sustainable economic model for that sector. So, and and at the same time, taking care of the of the social access to it. But it will come because the Haitian people, when given the right opportunity, when given the access, they usually do very well. I think we had a, a very wide-ranging discussion in terms of, of, of what the government is focused on. I want to thank all of you for attending and, and for your questions and your input. And I'd like to close by uh, starting with a round of applause again for our Prime Minister. Thank you very much, Anton, and thank you, Mr. Prime Minister, for being with us uh, here today at CSIS. Uh, to uh, keep things uh, fairly orderly, and, and the Prime Minister is on a schedule, but I know that he would like to be able to meet some of you and to shake your hands. Um, we'll have about uh, 10 minutes uh, right here at, at the bottom of the, the stage uh, where he will be uh, able to uh, meet you, and you can come up and, and say hello. I know that. Uh, uh, he would like that very much, and, and you would too. Um, I would also encourage you, since we have such a distinguished group in, in the audience today, I'd like to encourage you to take this time also to exchange business cards among yourselves and to uh, get to know each other. Um, and again, thank you very much for coming to this event at CSIS.